Whoa, Professor Ramon, and now with backgrounds, ooh, for your viewing pleasure. But let's just jump right into it. I don't want it to distract too much from the subject matter. It's just a little something extra, extra thought I throw in, see what happens, what kind of response I get from people. If I like it, I'll do more of it. If not, eh, I'll just dump it. But, so, we were talking chapter 35 when we left off, right? Uh, we did the first half of it. We were talking principles of antibiotic um, therapy or administration of antibiotics, right? We had principles down pack. See that video if you want to learn more about that. Uh, and the chapter 35 began on page 535. And then we said we were going to dive into now the drugs themselves, the actual antibacterial drugs. And I like the way the drugs at a glance, page 535, has them all separated into their own little gangs, right? You have the penicillins, that's one gang, the cephalosporins, the tetracyclines, macrolides, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, sulfonamides, the carbamen, carb, P's and B's throw me off. I think I'm dyslexic with my P's and B's. Carbapenems and miscellaneous antibiotics and then the enter anti tubercular drugs so we're going to go through all of these classes and each one is going to have its own differences and similarities uh you'll be responsible for knowing at least a few examples of each one of them um and you'll see what i mean before we actually dive into penicillin turn the page turn the page page 538 those two terms right there we talked about them the last time bacterial Cidal as opposed to bacterial static, two different things. Because look at what the term bacterial cidal means, like suicidal death, die. You see that? So it says medications that accomplish this goal, the goal of eliminating a, a, a pathogen by killing the bacteria. Those are called bacterial cidals because it says some drugs do not kill the bacteria, but instead they slow their growth, allowing the body's natural defenses to kick in and eliminate the microorganism. These are called bacterial statics. So it's kind of like one way of doing it is by actually destroying the pathogen, the bacteria, and the other way is by sending a saboteur. So you send a saboteur, you know what a saboteur is? Somebody that commits sabotage, you sneak them into the house and then they destroy something and they leave and then the house falls apart on its own. Does that make sense? So some drugs work as a bactericidal, they actually kill the bacteria, they send a soldier, the other one is bacterial static. It sends a saboteur on the inside to disrupt something so that now the bacteria slows down or cannot reproduce or totally slows down the reproduction and then your own immune system kicks in. So two different strategies. Does that make sense? So we do have different classes of drugs. Which one of them are bactericidal? Which one of them are bacterial statics? The different classifications, penicillin, cephalosporin, which one is which? Is there a quick and easy way to understand which is which? Well, if we turn to page 542, that's where we begin with the drugs, each, each category, and we're starting with the penicillins. And then it breaks up, and then you see your prototype drug there for penicillin is PENG. Then you turn the page and you go cephalosporins, and then your prototype drug is cefosilin. Then you have the tetracyclines, etc. You see the pattern, and there's your, there's your prototype. Da -ba -da -da. There's your prototype. Da -ba -da -da. Prototype. Pro see? So we have all of the prototype drugs here, quick and easy, so that we can see if we can identify a pattern between all of them. Okay. So how does a drug actually kill a bacteria, a, a, a single cell organism, a bacteria? Well, it depends on the structure of it. And one specific difference between the structure of a bacteria and the single cell organism and the structure of a human cell is cell membrane versus cell wall. So animal cells, a single cell of an animal, us, right? Uh, those have phospholipid bilayers. So that's a cell membrane. You see that? That's why and a phospholipid bilayer is very fluid. That's how bacteria can enter a cell very easily or get onto a receptor and get into a cell. So they're very susceptible, right? But we got defenses that take care of them. Either way, the plant cell and the bacterial cell, those single cell organisms of that level, those have cell walls. So these, some of these drugs, which are the soldiers, are there to pierce through the cell wall and that's how it actually kills the bacteria. So those drugs that actually affect cell walls and destroy it, ah, those are your soldiers, those are your bacterial cytokines. Because some of these classifications of drugs, on the other hand, 
they don't do anything to the, to the, to the cell wall. Instead, they send in a saboteur. And it goes inside, and it'll attack something inside the bacteria, one of its organelles, right? Like it's either its nucleus, or its DNA, or its ribosomes, or its uh, endoplasmic reticulum. No, I don't know if single cell organisms that level have that. But you see what I'm saying. One of the organelles, it'll attack one of those. You get it? So one way that you can divide all these classifications we're looking at is, well, are they bacterial bactericidal or bacterial static? And then when they're bacterial static, what type of organelle do they have hit? Do you see the cascade opening up? All right, so here's the quick and dirty way how to look at it. So we're going to look at prototype drug on page 543, penicillin. Look at the therapeutic class, antibacterial, okay? But what type of antibacterial, cytal or static? We'll look at the pharmacological class, science talk, cell wall inhibitor. Penicillin, bacterial, cytal. Turn the page. Cephozolin. Pharmacological class. Cell wall inhibitor. Bacterial cytal. Cephalosporins and penicillins are bacterial cytal. Turn the page. Tetracycline. It's its own class. Antibacterial. Got it. Pharmacological class. Tetracycline and protein synthesis inhibitor. That's a saboteur. Bacterial static. Next one. Macrolides, down to the bottom. Your example is erythromycin. Therapeutic class, antibacterial, sure. But what is the pharmacological class? Macro protein synthesis inhibitor, bacterial static. Next one, aminoglycosides, gentamicin. Pharmacological class, protein synthesis inhibitor, bacterial static. Next one, fluoroquinolone, ciprofloxacin, right? Antibacterial and Bacterial DNA synthesis inhibitor, bacterial static. Next one, sulfonamides. Next page, 553. Tri trimethoprim sulfamethoxyl. So Let's get that another try. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim. Down at the bottom, pharmacological class, folic acid inhibitor. Bacterial static. Hey, you ruined my flow right now. Damn it, Cipro. Isonazid. This is going to be one of your TB drugs. Pharmacological class. Myotic acid, mycotic acid inhibitor. Bacterial static. So, if we look at all of the classes of drugs we're going to be talking about today, only two are bactericidal. The penicillins and the cephalosporins. Everything else is bacterial static. Ooh, you're getting smarter, right? Cool. But now let's focus on one class at a time. Let's go back to page 542, penicillins. So something that penicillins and cephalosporins have in common breaks through cell walls on the, on the bacteria. Okay? So I would say there's similarities. If you're allergic to penicillin, your option is to maybe try cephalosporins, but there's probably a chance you're going to be allergic, maybe a little bit of a chance also, because look at the similarity in something in them that does a bacterial cytal as opposed to statics. So they're similar but different, and we'll see why. So look on page 542, penicillin binding protein. So uh, every cell on our body, our cell membranes with a phospholipid bilator and tons of receptors for tons of stuff. That's why we get poisoned so easily by things or infected. We have a penicillin binding. No, it's this. Uh, many bacterial cell walls have a substance called the penicillin binding protein. My bad. Back up there. That serves as a receptor for the penicillin. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So uh, some bacteria, a lot of bacteria. Just like our cell membranes have a lot of receptors on our phospholipid bilayer, their cell walls have receptors on the cell wall that can bring certain substances in. So one of those receptors is called a penicillin binding protein. So for those bacteria that actually die because of penicillin, they die because of this protein that they have on the cell wall. Ooh, nice recovery there. Huh. Sheep! Sheep, why not? <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's see, down at the bottom. The structure of penicillin is important to understand why some bugs 
The structure of penicillin itself is important to understand why some bugs die with penicillin and some don't. Because there's some bugs out there that if you give it penicillin, it's not going to do anything at all to it. Okay, so think of penicillin. Uh, think of a bacteria like a tic tac. That's a bacteria. One bacteria, like a little tic tac. Now think of the tic tac with a little fuzz around it, kind of like really like cotton candy all around. That little cotton candy all around that little tic tac. That fuzz, that's actually an enzyme that certain bacteria develop. Not all, certain bacteria. So the bacteria that, that develop this little fuzz around it, that little fuzz down at the bottom is called the beta-lactamase ACE. It's an enzyme. Beta-lactamase, also known as pelicinase ACE. Anything that's an enzyme ACE breaks something apart. So these bacteria that have that fuzz around it, called the penicillinase, when penicillin comes to attack it, it neutralizes it. You see that? So the bacteria that produce penicillinase, then you cannot use penicillin to fight them. You see that? That's how you know which bugs you can use penicillin for and which ones you can't, because you have to identify whether or not the bug makes penicillinase. This picture down at the bottom of 543 shows you at the very top the shape of the molecule of penicillin. Look at the little area that's got a yellow box. That's the area that when it comes in contact with this penicillinase, you see how it has a bacteria? It changes it. So look at how that little yellow box goes from this way to this way. And when you change that little box right there from this way to this way on, on, on the molecule of penicillin, look at what it says on the right-hand side. You, you inactivate it. You inactivate. That is the effect of pen penicillinase. So that's why some bacteria penicillins won't work at all. But some they, but a good chunk of them they do. Does that make sense? So there's different types of penicillin as well because what we've done is we've enhanced penicillin. So we've added to penicillin to either to enhance it and make it a little bit more stronger. So there's different levels of penicillin. There's the plain Jane. Good old-fashioned penicillin, that they call that the natural penicillin. At the bottom of page 542, way at the top, penicillin, table 35.2. Penicillins, and then look at the way the table's divided. Natural penicillins, penicillin ACE-resistant drugs. Ah, so these are drugs that can be given to a bacteria that produces that fuzz, that produces that protein penicillinase. You can give it that you can give it this. It's a penicillinase resistant staphylococcus. You can give some of this as well. You see that? A little bit further down, look at how you're getting into a broad spectrum. Ah, there you go. Remember the concept of broad spectrum antibiotics as opposed to narrow spectrums? Yes, this level of penicillin, broad spectrum. So plain Jane broad spectrum uh penicillin-like drug is gonna be right there, amoxicillin. You need to know that drug for sure. You definitely need to know penicillin G because that's your prototype drug for natural penicillins. And then I do want you to, you know what? You should know one of the penicillinase resistant uh, drugs. Let's go with, let's go with the bottom one, oxacillin, oxacillin. So at least you know one natural penicillin, penicillin G. You're going to know one penicillinase resistant uh, drug, right, for those bugs. And oxacillin, that's a strong one. Look at IV, only IV. Look at that, it jumps. And it's per, per weight. They got to weigh you. Interesting. You see that? Then look at the next one, broad spectrum ones. That's the next level. You should know the, the first two. Amoxicillin, which is plain Jane amoxyl, which is starting to get a little weak. And then the the augmented like augmentation to make bigger the better the bigger version of amoxicillin amoxicillin with cl clavulinate acid and it's called augmented you see that so those are the two the two broad spectrums that's probably what they're going to put you on after you draw the labs from the cultures you put them on the broad spectrum the results come back holy smokes you need something more specific stop the augmentin and restart them on the a specific other antibiotic that you need to give. See that? And then way down at the bottom, you have the extended spectrum. So this one's even further, kills even a little bit further out on the spectrum. 
So remember when I was saying the spectrum, I was saying the example, let's pretend that we have the name of every single bacteria, one after the other right here, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, see? And then a broad spectrum is going to be able to kill about this much of them for the most part. But there's always those one or two on the edges that, oh, no, you need a specific drug. So where at the bottom it says broad spectrum, and then the next one is extended spectrum, even more. You see that? This one says anti-pseudonomal because pseudonomus is a whole other ballgame altogether of, of, um, of uh, pathogen as well. So look at how we have in this one. You should know the first one, piperazilin. Yeah, piperazilin and tozabactam, that's very popular, zosin. That one is for uh, infected pressure ulcers, IV. I see that in the hospital. Right? Anyways, there's a nice conversation more about all the penicillins up at the top of 542, but I think that gives them good justice. Your prototype drug is penicillin G. Therapeutic class, antibacterial, yeah, but and bactericidal, bacteriostatic. And then you look over here, it's a cell one inhibitor. Ah, bacterial-cidal. Right, right. So look at what it says. Similar to penicillin V, because look at on the list, you have a penicillin G and a penicillin V. And it says, but penicillin G, the G, the big G, the gangster, <laughs> is a drug of choice against streptococci, strepto, pneumococci, staphylococci organisms, and that's the shapes of them. You see that? That do not produce penicillinase and are shown to be susceptible by culture and sensitivity testing. So a culture sensitivity, that's the one that I say they need the sample, they put it on the auger plate, and then they let it sit for a while. So what grows, that's the culture. But then they take samples of that, and they put a little, they have their ways that they do testing, and they test a whole bunch of different medications, and which one does it die with, and then that. So that's a culture to identify what the bug is, and then the sensitivity, to identify, does it make penicillinase? And uh, if if so, what other medications might be better applicable? Does that make sense? So that's the lab, the culture, and sensitivity. A little bit further down on the next paragraph, only 15 to 30% of an oral dose is actually absorbed. So no surprise, we usually give this IM or IV. And man, IM, that sucker hurts. I've had to give, give little kids this. Oh, I hate giving children shots, but I've had to be the bad guy. Uh, administration alert, parenteral administration, observe, allergic reaction, all of all of medications, penicillins, antibiotics, IM, IV, 30 minutes, watch out. Yeah, 30 minutes for parenteral, not for oral, parenteral. After parenteral administration, observe for possible allergic reaction for 30 minutes, especially following the first dose. Hint, hint, that's a good test question right there. Up at the top, adverse effects, pain at the insertion site. And then uh, look at the last sentence on adverse effect. While most allergic reactions usually happen within the first few minutes, right? Late hypersensitivity reactions may occur several weeks after a regimen. So it has been known to happen. Can't say it's too, too often, but that's a good research paper to see exactly how often is that happening, right? A little bit further down, it says drug-drug interactions. Or oral contraceptives, don't forget about that. Yes, the uh, antibiotics will always decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So you want to tell uh, females of childbearing age uh, for them to pick other types of uh, birth control in the meantime. Right? Uh, that's about it for the penicillins. That's pretty good. You turn the page, and now we've got the cephalosporins. There's a whole different gang altogether, right? So they are similar to penicillins in that they are bacterial cidal, right? And look at how they come in generations. The first generation, on, I'm on page 544, table 35.3. You see that? And at the top, first generation, right? So those were the oldest ones that came out. And then later, they improved on them. Second generation, then they improved on them. Third, and then the fourth and fifth, which are fairly new. So the differences between the generations is really that they, uh, the wider spectrum, the spectrum just got a little bit wider and wider with each one, is my understanding. So let's confirm that that's so before I teach you some science fiction. Page 544, left-hand side, down at the bottom. Symptoms of penicillin allergy. Symptoms of penicillin allergy include rash, puritis, fever, within the first 15, 10 minutes. But then there's always that delayed one, right? So, yeah. Incidence of anaphylaxis, airway closing up, itching, right? Ranges from 0.4% to 2% of the time. Miss, right? Gotta watch. 
allergies to one penicillin uh, to one penicillin increases the risk of allergy to one of the other ones. Oh my God, I'm still reading penicillin. I thought this was already cephalosporin, but good to know. That's where the air, the part about the uh, my camera here. I'm functioning too many things at once. Well, that's good to know for the penicillins right there. But what about the cephalosporins right next to it? Primary therapeutic use of the cephalosporins, gram-negative infections. Yeah. And for patients who cannot tolerate the less expensive uh, penicillins. So cephalosporins are one bump up. You know, it's not the cheap pickup, but it's the nicer one, <laughs> right? It's one level up. And I'll tell you what I mean, because right now we're going to get to the Cadillac of antibiotics as well. It says, uh, there's lots of different cephalosporins. It says the next paragraph, like the penicillins, many cephalosporins contain the beta-lactam ring, responsible for the antimicrobial, in this case, bacterial cytal effects, right? A little bit further down, look at your bullet points, first generation, second generation, third. Basically, what's happening is you're just increasing the, the, the spectrum with each time, and then it's just giving you what they're more effective towards. Uh, I like the sentence on page 545, right-hand side way at the bottom. It starts on 545 and it continues. Nurses must be aware. Nurses must be aware that 1 to 7 percent, that's what I thought I was reading right now, 1 to 7 percent of the patients who are allergic to penicillin will also exhibit a cross sensitivity to the cephalosporins. Good to know. But it's a lesser chance because if it's 1, 1 to 7, that's still kind of up there, right? Yeah, a little bit further down, last sentence in that same paragraph. Either generation, earlier generation cephalosporins caused kidney toxicity, but the adverse effects also diminish with the newer drug classes as well. Look at that. Nice. So your examples are over on page 544. And from the first generation, cephalosporin. So this one's going to be rough on the kidneys. because They just said, right, the ones that are older are a little rougher on the kidneys, right? So cefazolin, also known as ANCEF, this is your first generation prototype drug. It says adverse effects, diarrhea and abdominal cramping, nausea, fatigue, but a lot of this sounds common with a lot of antibiotics. Uh, but over on the prototype box for it on page 545, cefazolin is beta-lactamol antibiotic, so we know that it's got that ring, but if you have beta-lactamase, it's going to flip it, so now it's inactivated. So this is... Um, used for the treatment of prophylaxis of bacterial infections, particularly those that are caused by susceptible gram-positive bacteria. So gram-positives. Look at the next, uh, the last sentence on, on that paragraph. Cephazolin is not effective against MRSA. Nope. Uh, I don't think penicillins are either. Uh, we'll get into that because I've got the drugs in here for the MRSA. Look at this. Anyways, so um, it says the drug is sometimes used for infection prophylaxis in patients who are undergoing surgical procedures. They might give it to you the day before or the next day, usually about 12 hours ahead of time. Uh, administration alert, deep IMs because the cephalosporins hurt when you give them IM. Uh, this is usually an IV I think I've seen most of the time. Cephalosporins are well tolerated by most patients and then of course, on the right-hand side, approximately one to four percent have experienced some sort of a uh, some kind of a allergic reaction. So it could be mild, but it could be something severe, right? And then pain at the injection site always. Uh, that's the main thing to know about that one. That's going to be your prototype drug. But I want you to know one more. Look at your second generation cephalosporins, page five forty-four. Look at the third generation. You uh, you should know the first and the last one. The first and the last one of the third generation. Because the first one is Cephdenir, 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 Cephdenir. I know it is Omnicef. Cephdenir. Highlight that one. Uh, otitis media for children. This is usually the drug of choice lately. Yeah, it's for your, for your infection. So some of you that are parents have wound up in the emergency room with your kid, your infection. I think you're familiar. You might be familiar with this drug already. So Omnicef. That's a third generation. And then the other one is ceftriaxone, down at the bottom, ceftriaxone. So look at Omnicef, that's PO. It's the light of the third generation. So less side effects, broader spectrum, good for ear infections. But if you move down to the very bottom, 
ceftriaxone, look at IV, IM, one or two grams, wham, bam, wham, bam. Or sometimes it's just like four grams per day max. Or sometimes you just get one shot and you're good to go. So they'll give this for certain STDs because this will knock out STDs. This can knock out strong infections. Uh, this is a very effective and sometimes a go-to when there isn't much time for diagnostics and there's a lot of symptoms and just knock it out. Boom, give them a Rosef and I am, see what happens. And if in 24 hours you get great, problem solved. And if it doesn't, you got a problem because if Rosefin's not knocking it out, you got something a little bit more complicated on your hands. Um, obviously something that produces a, a, a penicillin ACE. Does that make sense? Yeah. So anyways, what else do we have on that one? The other thing, uh, ceftriaxone hurts like a sucker. They all hurt when given IM. Uh, when you're reconstituting a medication that comes in a powder form, you're going to reconstitute with a uh, normal saline and then administer. This drug is different. This one, classic, you're going to um, reconstitute with lidocaine. And lidocaine is that stuff that numbs, that they'll inject you with, and then it makes the skin numb. Or in the gums, you know, for stitches, or in the gums when they're pulling out a tooth. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. They actually mix it with that. They, us, nurses, draw it up, and then you give that IM. And the sucker still hurts really good. It feels like you got punched in the butt really, <laughs> really bad. Punched in the butt. How about that? Next page. Uh, tetracyclines. Oh, wait. There's a little bit more with the... We, we read that. Yeah. Earlier generations. Toxicity. We're good. Tetracyclines now. And then it gives you the examples of the tetracyclines at the top. And then which is your drug of choice? Good old... I mean, your prototype drug. Good old-fashioned, old-school tetracycline. Very old drug. And then that's your prototype drug we're going to discuss. But let's read a little bit. Tetracyclines act by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis. Bacterial static. See that? Yeah. And it says, by binding with the bacterial ribosomes, that's what it attacks a ribosome, which differs in structure from human ribosomes. That's why it doesn't affect the human ribosome. It only affects the bacterial one. Uh, let's see what it says. Uh, the tetracycline slow uh, bacterial microbacterial growth and exert a bacterial static effect. There you go. Yep, yep. On the next hand side, it talks about the right widespread use in the 1950s led to a resistance of it. So that's why it became kind of an old school drug that now they're kind of going back to it a little bit more often than they did in the past because they overused it and a lot of the bacteria became resistant to it. So. Now some time has passed. That bacteria has now been destroyed by other medications. Those strains are gone. So now the newer strains can be affected by some tetracycline. So that's why now it's a little bit more in use. So it was high in popularity, then went low, and now it's kind of a, on an uptick again. Isn't that interesting how even the medications have, a, have their own cycles of use and popularity as new ones come up, yeah? So... Uh, look at this little tip it says about it, tetracycline, right-hand side, second paragraph towards the top. And it says about gastric distress is relatively common with tetracycline. However, uh, patients tend to take it with food because these drugs bind with metal ions such as calcium and iron. Tetracycline should not be taken with dairy products and iron supplements. So meats as well. So preferably not with meals that have meat because iron, meat, and uh, beans have iron. Uh, what, are the, what else? Milk, anything, dairy products. But dairy products are not recommended to be taken with any antibiotics at all. You will affect absorption. You won't absorb the full dose. You'll coat it, and when it gets into the system, it, it's like coated, so it's not activated at all. So you decrease the amount of what's absorbed. And what is absorbed is not very strong. So no dairy products when you're taking any antibiotics, no antacids of any kind either because antacids contain calcium ions. So Rolaids, Tums, and those are the three things I, I think I had mentioned to look out for, right? Grapefruit juice, overdose, right? Antacids, underdose. And then those antipsychotics called the MAO inhibitors, oh, that was, those interact with everything. Those are the three things you need to write that down. All medications are probably going to interfere with those three. Grapefruit juice, antacids and MAO inhibitors. And we haven't gotten there. It'll be a while before we get MAO inhibitors. But just there's different types of antipsychotic drugs and the MAO inhibitors interact with everything. Everything. They screw everything up. All different medications. Even your normal metabolism. 
So my point was here, uh, calcium, don't take calcium supplements or uh, multivitamins along with tetracycline. It'll bind with it. You won't absorb it. So tetracycline, page 547, pharmacological class, protein synthesis inhibitor. So very popular for H. pylori. So H. pylori is a, 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 a bacteria that uh, infects ulcers in the stomach. So H. pylori is one of the reasons, one of the things that uh, tetracycline can be given to for. Look at the administration alerts, oral drug with a full glass of water. So you can have something light provided it doesn't have any iron, any calcium or anything like that. So it has to be something really light that you take. And then look at that with a full glass of water. Decreases the esophageal irritation. Look at the second administration alert. No antacids for any antibiotics. On any one to three hours of separated. You see that? And then the adverse effects. Being a broad spectrum antibiotic, tetracycline has a tendency to affect vaginal and oral and intestinal flora. So it could cause a super infection in you. Does that make sense? So very often, some women that put, used to come and see me for um, uh, prescriptions for UTI when I was a nurse practitioner, uh, they needed two prescriptions because they were of the type that already know, oh, you put me on an antibiotic, not necessarily tetracycline, any antibiotic. Uh, some women, diabetics, or some just for, that's just their body chemistry. And uh, it makes, it, what happens when you use it? I got lost here. Yeah, it causes uh, yeast infections. And it can cause yeast infections and then yeast infections of the throat as well. Uh, so that's the reason. And it can also kill normal flora in the stomach. That's why we tell people to eat a little bit of acidophilus or some yogurt as well. Yeah. Look at the last sentence in that paragraph, adverse effects. Other common side effects, in, in, effects include discoloration of the teeth and photosensitivity. So you got to stay out of the sun. And this is not the only one you got to stay out of the sun for. The... Fluoroquinolones, you got to stay out of the sun also. So tetracycline, fluoroquinolones, stay out of the sun. Stay out of the sun. Uh, common side effect is the discoloration of teeth. So uh, that's another thing you got to keep an eye on too. And um, severe diarrhea, so it causes discontinuation. Yeah, you, uh, you guys just got to warn the patient about them. They came out for the teeth getting stained a little bit. That's why. Uh, what else do we say? No dairy products for herbal and fruit. And I think you're good with the tetracycline. On the macrolides, they begin also on page 546 at the bottom. It says the first macrolides were isolated out of streptomycin. And then it's the choice drugs for a few infections. And then if you hop over to page 547 on the right-hand side at the top, the newer macrolides, so now we're talking macrolides. So the first one was penicillins, cephalosporins. These were tetracyclines. And now we're talking macrolides. The max, the max. What's with the max on the right hand side? The newer max are synthesized from erythromycin. So they include things like the Zithromax or the Z pack. A single dose can be given for uh, gonorrhea of azithromycin, a gram. They can give it to you one dose, yeah. So Z packs, azithromycin, clarithromycin, yeah. Urethromycin, page 548, azithromycin, clarithromycin, urethromycin, all of those. The mycins are the max. So remember my mac, my mac, not your mac, my mac, my mac, mac, macrolides, my, macrolides, my, mycins, urethromycin, clarithromycin, you see that? Mycin. But be careful because right now we're going to look at the aminoglycosides on the other side. Yeah. Mycin versus, oh, where well, they got mycins too. So careful. I'm glad we pointed that out. So both the macrolides, which we're about to discuss, and the aminoglycosides, which are, which are coming, they both end in mycin. So that's going to be your tricky zone. Make sure to, don't let the ending work against you this time. You see that? So erythromycin is going to be your, your prototype drug for the macrolides. You see that? So erythromycin, uh, I, I pointed out, you need to know azithromycin also, the very first one. Azithromycin, and you need to know the z pack in particular, and this is, this is the dosage right here. Highlight this for the exam. Azithromycin, page 548, table 35.5. Azithromycin, Zithromax, z packs PO, 
five milligrams first dose today, and then 250 milligrams on day four through two, three, and four. So it's a five-day course of therapy. I'm going to ask you a question to see if you remember that because that's very common, and we need to educate patients. So it's 500 now. Usually it's two pills today, and then one pill, one pill, one pill, one pill, five days, you're done. No, no such thing as leftover antibiotics. The other one is urethromycin, a little bit further down, and that's what I tell you, 250s, 500s. Let's look at that. It's your prototype drug down at the bottom, antibacteri antibacterial. This is a macrolide. This is a protein synthesis inhibitor. It's a bacterial static. Erythromycin inactivated by the stomach acid and is thus formulated as a coated acid-resistant tablet. So it needs to get down into the duodenum and down into the small intestine and then it can get absorbed. It says, it's the main, its main application is for patients who are unable to tolerate penicillins or may have a penicillin-resistant infection. Boom! That's their use. That's their use. So if the bug produces penicillin, pen, penicillinase, then penicillin's not going to work. Cephalosporins are not going to work. This is your area. This is where you're going. Because tetracyclines are old school. They'll stain your teeth and yikes. Stay out of the sun and stuff. You see that? But here in this case, boom, you can go with urethromycin or azithromycin. You see that? Look at that. So a little bit further down, it says... It has a spectrum that is similar to the penicillins, and it is effective against most gram-positive bacteria. Sweet. It is sometimes used to treat susceptible, yada, yada. It gives a whole bunch of examples. Administration alert. Oral drug. Empty stomach, full glass of water. Empty stomach, full glass of water. So tetracyclines you could probably eat, but just you got to stay away from other stuff. And then the next one, uh, if it's liquid, shake the bottle, no problem. Then it says, ah, that's your main thing right there. Erythromycin. One of the main things that they'll use this for, I've seen this as a pill. I've seen this as a little, it looks like a like a deodorant, but it's a you uncap it and it's like a little wet spot, like a spongy. You squeeze it and it the sponge gets soaked with the erythromycin, and then you dab it on the skin for acne vulgaris. I've seen that used, yeah. Alrighty. So these are mycins, but it's azithromycin and clarithromycin. But azithromycin and erythromycin. Erythromycin. C E. No. A E. A E macrolides. A E macrolides. A azithromycin. E erythromycin. A E macrolides. Mycin. But these are aminoglycosides. These are also mycins. Look at the examples we have. We're going to focus on one in particularly. We're going to focus on gentamicin. However, neomycin is popular. Streptomycin is popular. Tobramycin is popular. Highlight in particularly tobramycin. So you need to know gentamicin and tobramycin. Tobramycin also comes as ophthalmic, as an ointment. So this can be given for pink eye as an ointment. And that's when your your uh, your instructions for administration of drugs, that's an ointment. Go back and read the process, nursing process procedure for the administration of ophthalmic ointment. One inch ointment affected eye. You see that? Or it could come in drops. I'm going to say ointment. So go back and read what was the steps and fundamentals for the application of an ointment in the eye. And we're talking tobramycin. See that? The other one is gentamicin. And that's your prototype drug down at the bottom. And I have some history, unfortunately, with this drug here. So aminoglycosides, it says, uh, da, 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 1942, toxic, okay, although more toxic than the antibiotic could be the other. Although more toxic than other antibiotics. Classes. Oh, yes. Like I said, I have a history with gentamicin. I'll tell you about right now. Aminoglycosides have important therapeutic applications. And then it's more for mycobacteriums. What's mycobacterium? Where have we heard the term mycobacterium before? Ah, they can be given for TB. But it's not going to be the only thing. Remember, for TB, you're going to give two to three drugs for up to a year. And we'll get to that right now. Mycobacteria, and for some protozoa, you know what a protozoa is, right? That's already a single-cell organism with a tail, and a, it's ready to go. It's a creature. 
So this, these drugs, these gentamicins can be given for that, but these gentamicins are bad for, for our bodies. Neurotoxicity, autotoxicity. You see what I mean right now? Let's look at your prototype drug over on page 549. Gentamicin, therapeutic class, antibacterial. Pharmacological class, aminoglycoside, and it's a protein synthesis inhibitor. This is a bacterial static. Gentamicin, broad spectrum, uh, broad spectrum, bacterial static. Yeah, they, oh, bacterial cytal. Oh, bacteriocidal antibiotic, usually prescribed for serious urinary respiratory. Nerve. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Protein synthesis inhibitor. It must affect a protein that actually kills the bacteria. Oops. Oh, I don't know. My camera went off there for a second there. I kept talking. I hope it kept recording. So um, this is bactericidal. Look at this. Gentamicin. Page 548, gentamicin broad spectrum bactericidal, usually prescribed as serious urinary respiratory nervous infections when less toxic antibiotics are contraindicated. How about that? It is bactericidal. So look at the other ones that we were, this one is the previous one, uh, erythromycin. Let's let me say something. Let's see myself. No, you're right. Because we had looked it up. Yeah. So we, we caught it because we're being thorough. So highlight this. We well, got three that are bactericidal. Penicillins, cephalosporins, aminoglycosides. Oh, wow. I just learned something new. I learned it just with you as well. What you need to know about this drug, and this is the effect. Uh, this was given to me a lot as a kid. Uh, I grew up on the border in Texas, on the border of Texas and Mexico. And every often, every time I'd get an ear infection or a throat infection, my dad was very quick to go run across the border into Mexico and go buy this over the counter. They'll sell it to you. You'll, you, you, can, you can pay for it. Then he'd come back and give it to me. I am. And I'm sad to say I have a little bit of hearing loss in one of my ears. Probably in both, but it's worse in this ear than in this one. That's why sometimes I kind of lean in when I talk. Or, or sometimes I've been told I talk. I get shushed so often at restaurants. And that's the reason. It's because of uh, so much of this stuff that's been given to me as a kid. So look at what the black box warning. Neurotoxicity may manifest as autotoxicity. And that's exactly how it manifested with me. Uh, may produce hearing loss. Balance. No, I don't got no plan. I don't think about it. I have had some balance issues, which may become permanent with continued use. Tinnitus, vertigo. Tinnitus is ee, high pitch. I don't have that. Thank goodness. Uh, persistent headaches. Early signs of autotoxicity. Other neurological effects. Neurotoxicity, per paresthesias, which means numbness, twitching, seizures, uh, neurotoxics, uh, da, 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 neuromuscular block, nephrotoxicity as well. So you're talking neuronephro, neuronephro. Those are the black box warnings for the, for the aminoglycosides. With example, tetracycline. The other example is tobramycin, but that's an ointment for the eye. Boom. Safer, it's localized, right? Not a systemic effect. Cool, very good. Next one is a good old fashioned, the fluoroquinolones on page 550. And now we're getting into Cipro territory. So look at the example you have 550 down at the bottom, 35.7 fluoroquinolones. It comes in generations first, second, third, fourth, the second generation. I have never heard of the first generation one, but the second generation, ciprofloxacin. Yeah. Ciprofloxacin, and this is Cipro, that's your prototype drug. What you need to know about this drug is that it is the drug of choice for um, anthrax, that's for starters, right? And it says Ciprofloxacin, gen uh, second generation, fluoroquinolone, most widely prescribed drug in its class. So from all of these, this is the one that's given the most. Inhibits DNA synthesis, Ciprofloxacin affects bacterial replication and DNA repair, bacterial static. More effective against gram negative than gram positive, UTIs, sinusitis, pneumonia, skin infections, yada yada. Rapidly absorbed when it's given PO, can be given IV, it comes in drops for the eye and for the ear as well. However, it says well tolerated, no problem, black box warning. So here's the deal all of the fluoroquinolones, you gotta stay out of the 
sunlight, that's for starters, but the worst thing from all of the fluoroquinolones, except the ones that are taking PO and have a systemic effect, they have a tendency to liquefy the Achilles tendon. The tendon that connects your heel to your leg, it liquefies it and it snaps. Not always, obviously, or we'd stop using it, but there is a black box warning to the point that they have to put it on there. So look at what it says, black box warning, tendonitis. So it starts with pain in the tendon. So we have to warn patients and educate them that if they, be, they start with tendon pain right here, right here, in the back of the knees, the tendons, and down in the Achilles because that's the sucker that's going to snap, if any of them are going to snap. But it can give you tendonitis, tendon pain. That's all the fluoroquinolones. That's a test question, my friends. Tendonitis and tendon rupture may occur in patients all ages. Risk is especially high, patients over 60. Watch out for people with kidney failure, lung, lung transplant recipients, those receiving corticosteroids. So if you're on a corticosteroid, anything that ends in zone, oh, a bird, ah. All right, anyways, uh, fluoroquinolones may cause extreme muscle weakness in patients with myasthenia gravis. Look at that. So neuromuscular side effects here. That's what you need to know extra about CIPRO. You see that? Uh, let's see. Down at the bottom, uh, third generation, highlight Levaquin because it's common and it's popular. Yeah. And then down at the bottom, fourth generation, moxifloxacin. I like saying that. Moxifloxacin. If I ever have a dog, I'm going to call it moxifloxacin. Down at the bottom, Vigamox. These are drops for the eye. 100 bucks. 100 bucks a bottle. 90 some dollars a bottle if you have no insurance. Uh, and that's for severe pink eye as well. This is, it can affect, yeah, bacterial, bacterial pink eye. The, the, the goop, right? What do you call it? Conjunctivitis. Yeah, so know that one as well. And that's a fourth generation. So that's very powerful. So cool. That's your little quinolones right there. And then uh, you've got a sulfonamide drug that you need to know and your prototype drug on sulfonamide. And that's the only one I'm going to stick to on this list on page 552, table 35.8. That's the trimethoprim slash sulfamethoxazole, also known as TNP-SMZ. So TNP-SMZ, we mean that drug that's Bactrim. So Bactrim is actually two drugs in one, which is why if you look to the side, it just combines it. Oh, no, it has it as two different dosages. So you can have PO-160 of the TMP and 800 of a SMV. See that? And I'm sure it comes in different dosages of strength, varying of each of the two. So keep in mind that Bactrim comes in multiple dosages of the two drugs that are in one pill, Bactrim. So page 553, there you go. I'm not going to try to say it again. Bactrim, sulfonamide, folic acid inhibitor down at the bottom. A fixed dose combination of the SMZ with the TMP is the most frequently prescribed for UTI. But it can be given for pneumocystic carcinoma. This is a type of uh, lung con uh, infection that can develop sometimes with the immunocompromised. Talks about shingella, small bowel infections, keep, keep moving. Uh, action. Their action is synergistic of uh, the, the two drugs combined in the pill. Bacterial, uh, bactericidal. The bacterial kill is achieved by a fixed combination of the two. Boom, you have a, another bactericidal. So that's penicillins, cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, and the sulfa, the drugs, the sulfas, bacterial cidal, cidal, how about that? Got ahead of myself when I saw the inhibitors, right? But at least it's making us think about those details in here. God, I hope you stuck around for the whole video all the way to the end. Well, words of the wise, stick around to the end, right? Uh, let's see, greater bacterial kill, yada, 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 folding, selective. I was just reading to see if they might do both because I could see some drugs being a combination of both bactericidal and bacteriostatic. You see that? Yeah. So this is given for UTIs, and I would suspect that it's for simple UTIs. Keep in mind there's two types of UTIs. There's a simple UTI and a complicated UTI. 
If it's a female of childbearing age, simple UTI. If it's a male, right off the bat, that's a complicated UTI because men don't get UTIs. So when they do, it's a big deal. A uh, female complicated would be if they've got a comorbidity. So if you've got cancer, HIV, um, pneumonia, diabetes, and a UTI that's complicating things, that's a complicated UTI. So this is more for simple UTIs, but for complicated UTIs, they might be something a little bit stronger that might be needed because the condition is a little bit different. Might need multiple drugs to manage multiple things in addition to the UTI. Uh, contraindications if you're allergic to it, right? And then a little bit further down, drug-drug interaction may enhance the effects of certain anticoagulants. Wow, so write that down just to highlight that. These drugs may also increase methotrexate toxicity. We came up with that drug also earlier, right? methotrexate. Uh, down at the bottom, and then it says the renal elimination of the overdose. Uh, and signs of bone marrow suppression. Uh, bone marrow suppression occur during high dose therapy. Five to 15 of, right there, that last sentence. Look what can happen when you start giving too much sulfa drugs. You cause bone marrow suppression. Whoa, my camera goes off. I freak out. Bone marrow suppression. So what does that look like? Low red blood cells, low white blood cells, low platelets, and then be able to describe signs and symptoms. Let me rush because I want to make sure I keep this under one hour. Uh, what else do we have? The last but not least, uh, you've got the carbenopims, but we've got no prototype drug. The only one I do want to point out, page 555, is right smack in the middle, linezolid, lin linezolid, also known as Zyvox. Circle that, Zyvox, Zyvox. So this is a different class of drugs that are safe for high, high level infections. You see that? Uh, I want you to look on page 554, left hand side down at the bottom where it goes into the conversation of lisenolzid. It says lisenolzid is one of two drug classes of antibacterials called the oxolodid oxazolidinones. <laughs> it is an alternative to vancomycin. Highlight vancomycin as well. Find it in this list of drugs on 555, vancomycin, vancomycin, way down at the bottom, circle that one, vancomycin, for treating MRSA. Bing, 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 bing. Those are your two drugs to treat MRSA infections. Zyvox and vancomycin, but you need to know the generic names, unfortunately, for the exam. So linezolid, that's Zyvox, and vancomycin, that's vancosin. Those are the drugs of choice for MRSA. And the sentence continued. It is also approved to treat VRE. So those are two bugs you need to know. MRSA and VRE. Those are two drug-resistant uh, bugs that a lot of the other antibiotics don't even work for. So what are the drugs of choice? These right here. Yeah. Lysinolzid and vancomycin. Vancomycin. What you need to know very rough on the body, so there is such a thing as vancomycin levels. You have to have check what level, what are your levels in the serum because of the toxicities that it has. So look at what it says, vancomycin on page five five five. Scroll all the way across. What are we looking at? Super infect, nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, red man syndrome. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Red man syndrome. Turn the page five five six. Red man syndrome. A reaction that it can occur with rapid IV infusion is known as red man syndrome and results as large amounts of histamine are released in the body as a result of the drug being given IV too quickly. And it says symptoms include hypotension with flushing and the red rash, most often of the face, the neck, the trunks, and the upper body. Other significant side effects include yada, yada, yada. But that's what you need. That's what red man syndrome is for vancomycin on the previous page. Make that connection. Uh, and then the other thing about lenezolid. No, just that it's one of the two options for MRSA. And these are just kind of the miscellaneous anti-infectives. I don't expect for you to know that fancy name for them. They're hard to say. So try to just be able to point them out if I say which of the following is for MRSA, which of the following is not for MRSA. Uh, last but not least is the TB drugs. Let me see. I'll see. Try to keep it under an hour here. Uh, the TB drugs, what we've already started talking about is the amount of time, up to a year, 
So 556 starts drugs for tuberculosis, also known as mycobacterium, also known as consumption, also known as acid fast bacillus. All of those words mean TB. Don't forget, TB skin test. Leb, it's never about redness. It's about induration. You don't need your eyes to check a TB skin test. You need your fingers. You need a feel. You're feeling for hardness. You're not looking for redness. The degree of hardness indicates a positive, a positive Manitou test, but it does not mean a positive for TB. It means a positive Manitou test, which now means we require an x-ray. And when we get the x-ray, that is the confirmation of TB. Imaging, x-ray. A positive Manitou test means an x-ray is required. And you're not looking for redness. There's a sheep again. Hey, I'm not going to eat them. Uh, and it's not the it's not the redness, it's the, the hardness. Make sense? Alrighty. On the right hand side, page five five six, up at the top, tubercles, tuberculosis, keep scrolling down, second paragraph. Drug therapy for TB differs from that of most other infections. Mycobacterium have a cell wall that is resistant to penetration by most anti infective drugs. Medications to reach the organism isolated in the tubercles of the lungs. Uh, therapy continues 6 to 12 months right there. Although the patient may be infectious the entire time and have symptoms, it is critical that therapy continue the entire period. Uh, otherwise, you're going to develop multi-resistant infections. Make sense? So there you go. That's what you need. And then down at the bottom, it starts talking about, uh, yes, it's going to be how many drugs are you going to be, be, be giving? And it says initial phase, two months of a daily therapy with isonazib. That's your prototype drug, page 557. Circle it, isonazid. We'll come back to you. Then it says rifampin. So highlight it on this page also, page 557. Rifampin, right, rifampin. There it is, circle it. And then it also says pyrazin, pyrazinamide, pyrazinamide, PZA, pyrazinamide, PZA. Find it, there it is, circle it. And then it says, and ethambutol. Find ethambutol. Boom, up at the top, ethambutol. Those are your main drugs of choice for TB. Some combination of these four in some dosage for some point in time between six months and one year. And respiratory isolation and repeated magnitude tests periodically to see how we're doing. And chest x-rays for imaging. You see that? Those are your four drugs. The concerns with these drugs, I know that the only one that's focusing on here is going to be isonazid, but look down at the bottom that they can also give you ciprofloxin or a few of these other drugs in combination with the drugs that are on the top. But those four are your classic. Quick and dirty, just so what I remember right off the bat. Ethan, all of these, suicidality. When you're on TB medications, watch for the mind. Educate the family to watch for signs and symptoms of changes of behavior that are morbid or negative or suicidal. You must warn the patients about that. Yeah. The other thing is going to affect neuro. So neuro is the mind. and Neuro is also the eyes, hearing, feeling, sensation, neuro, head to toe, including the mind. Uh, the other thing too, rifampin, I believe this is the one that turns your, your secretions red-orange. Your tears turn red-orange, your sweat turns red-orange, your urine turns red-orange. So don't you have to warn them about this because otherwise they're going to urinate, they're going to think it's blood, and they're going to show up in the ER. So you must warn patients that are on rifampin about the orange-red tinge it's going to leave to all of their sweat. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, what else do we have? And then let's see what it has to say about isonazid. Over on the next page, isonazid. My mycolytic acid inhibitor, first-line drug for the treatment of mycobacterium. And you know what that means. Because the, uh, this is because decades of experience have shown it is superior safety profile and is the most effective single dose for the infection. I saw this exact by inhibiting synthesis by mycotic acids, which are essential components for the mycobacterium cell wall. It is bactericidal. Bactericidal. It is bactericidal for actively growing organism, but bacteriostatic for dormant mycobacterium. Boom, what we were talking about before. I bet you some of these drugs are bacteriostatic and bactericidal, and there it is. Look at that. Interesting, right? Very cool. So a little bit further down, approximately 10% of patients will develop some resistance to isonacid, which is why there's always going to be multiple drugs being thrown into the mix there. 
black box warning, warning, although rare, hepatotoxicity, sometimes fatal, jaundice or liver, 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 liver. Hepatotoxicity, highlight that, usually appears in the first one to three months. Yeah, with isonazid. Yeah. Then, you know how I said that all of these drugs for TB are going to affect neuro? We need to give something to protect the neuro because guaranteed it's going to affect neuro in some way, shape, or form. So you want to know what we give them? Red Bull. Not necessarily an actual Red Bull, but look at at the very bottom of isonazid, prototype drug, treatment for overdose, pyroxidine, vitamin B6. So they can give you vitamin, but either way, they might give you B6 and B12 shots or dosages uh, to alleviate some of the neural effects, especially, especially with a thambutol. Know these names of these four drugs. This is important. NCLEX is going to ask you about these four drugs for TB and then the amount of time that you need to take them. Guys, that is the whole chapter. Yikes. Right at an hour and 34 seconds. So I hope you like the new backdrop. Let me know if you think this is cool or if it's too distracting. I just figured I'd give you something different to look at. Uh, doing animation and editing, I can do it. It consumes too much time. But I just thought it kind of looked kind of cool. Or I can change up the backgrounds if people want something different. Just as an added extra. So see you on the next video. Let's get this uploaded. See you in a bit. Bye.